Well, good evening and welcome to this service of choral evensong at Washington National Cathedral, uh, highlighted in a special way this evening with the installation of the Archdeacon of the Episcopal Diocese of Washington, the Reverend Steve Seeley. We're so glad that members of Steve's family and friends could join us, as well as a large gathering from the diocese. We also have guests with us um, from as far as Knoxville, Tennessee. The Christian Academy of Knoxville is joining us this evening. They're of a large enough group that those of us in the choir cannot see them, but they can see us. So why don't we wave to the Christian Academy? We're so glad they're on the side. On the, but we're very, very happy that as part of your seventh grade experiences in Washington, you have joined us. And if others are here for the first time, this is a service uh, at the end of the day dedicated to beauty and the uh, offering of music from the choir, some of which we will join, others we will allow their words and music to wash over us and remind us of the grandeur and the glory of God. And it is in that context that we begin our prayers for ourselves and for this world. Again, welcome. How beautiful on the mountains are the feet of those who bring good tidings of salvation. We give thanks to the Father who has made us worthy to share in the inheritance 
of the saints in light.
A reading from the second letter of Timothy, wherein we hear the charge to spread the good news with diligence. In the presence of God and of Jesus Christ, who is to judge the living and the dead, and in view of his appearing and his kingdom, I solemnly urge you, proclaim the message, be persistent whether the time is favorable or unfavorable, convince, rebuke, and encourage with the utmost patience in teaching. For the time is coming when people will not put up with sound doctrine, but having itching ears, they will accumulate for themselves teachers to suit their own desires, and will turn away from listening to the truth and wander away to myths. As for you, always be sober, endure suffering, do the work of an evangelist, carry out your ministry fully. As for me, I am already being poured out as a libation, and the time of my departure has come. I have fought the good fight, I have finished the race, I have kept the faith. Here ends the reading.
Lectura del Evangelio según San Lucas, donde Jesús comienza su ministerio. Jesús volvió a Galilea lleno del poder del Espíritu Santo, y se habla de Él por toda la tierra de alrededor. Enseñaba en la sinagoga de cada lugar, y todos le alababan. Jesús fue a Nazaret, el pueblo donde se había criado. El sábado entró en la sinagoga, como era su costumbre, y se puso de pie para leer las escrituras. Le dieron al libro, a leer el libro del profeta Isaías, y al abrirlo encontró el lugar donde estaba escrito. El Espíritu del Señor está sobre mí, porque me ha consagrado para llevar la buena noticia a los pobres. Me ha enviado a anunciar libertad a los presos y dar vista a los ciegos, a poner en libertad a los oprimidos, a anunciar el año favorable del Señor. Luego Jesús cerró el libro, lo dio al ayudante de la sinagoga y se sentó. Todos los que estaban allí tenían la vista fija en él. Él comenzó a hablar, diciendo, Hoy mismo se ha cumplido la escritura que ustedes acaban de oír. Jesus, filled with the Holy Spirit, returned to Galilee, and a report about him spread throughout all the surrounding country. He began to teach in their synagogues and was praised by everyone. When he came to Nazareth, where he had been brought up, he went to the synagogue on the Sabbath day, as was his custom. He stood to read, and the scroll of the prophet Isaiah was given to him. He unrolled the scroll and found the place where it was written, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim to the release of the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to let the oppressed go free, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. And he rolled up the scroll, gave it back to the attendant, and sat down. The eyes of all the synagogue were fixed upon him. And then he began to say, Today the scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. Here ends the lesson.
I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power and the glory forever and ever. Thank you. 
faithful, the strength of those who labor, and the repose of the dead. We thank thee for the kindly blessings of the day, and humbly beseech thy merciful protection all the night. Bring us, we pray thee, in safety to the morning hours. Through him who died for us and rose again, thy Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ, our Lord. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of all our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O God, for you are our strength and our redeemer. Amen. Sometimes when I'm speaking with a person about questions of vocation, which I'm defining for this evening as that feeling inside that we have when we have the sense that we're being called or summoned to a particular kind of work or that we feel like we were created or that we would find our greatest fulfillment in a particular kind of work. So when I'm speaking to a person about that in in their life and especially when that person is feeling thwarted or discouraged, especially in their ability to gain access to the place where they could best live out their vocation. Sometimes in that moment, I'll ask a question that I felt the Holy Spirit put before my heart at a time of deep vocational disappointment. And the question is this. What do you feel you are called by God to be or to do that would be true for you, independent of any position or job, any financial remuneration or public recognition that you would do simply because it's you and you would do it no matter where you find yourself, and if the circumstances required, you would do it gladly for free. The time I I first asked myself that question, once I gained even a bit of clarity in the answer, what I felt inside was some Well, two things. I felt freedom and personal responsibility to live out my vocation as I had dared to give voice to it and owned it as real. The freedom was in knowing that it was the Spirit of God, I believe, that was calling me, and the Spirit was not restricted by any of the limitations that I felt restricted by, and that in the spirit there were no doubt innumerable ways I could live 
what I felt was one of the great claims of my life. But the other part I felt was responsibility um, to be about this vocation and to seek out, yes, the best possible places for me to do that, uh, the, the places that one ad artist I admire refers to as those, uh, those places of great potential, but not to allow disappointment when those places were denied me to stop me from doing my best in less than ideal circumstances, and indeed in those circumstances to do whatever I could to prepare myself should the best place or the great potential place come my way. So hold all of that thought, hold those thoughts over here for a moment. So I'd like to say something about the, um, our experiences in the Diocese of Washington in developing the ministry of deacons. Um, and you, you could imagine, you, you would imagine such a world where we would think of ourselves as, um, oh, you know, raising up deacons. We would identify those people who had the potential for servant leadership. We would identify those people who had the seeds of compassion for those living on the margins of the church and of our communities, and with a, a, a beginning sense of justice, and we would support them in the culti cultivation of these gifts. You could imagine such a world, but that wasn't our world. And this is what it was like. It was like, I, it was like we could see the people who were already deacons, and our job was to catch up to them give them a few things to add to their backpacks, and then ordain them as quickly as possible. And Steve was, Steve Seeley was one of those deacons. Um, I've known you, Steve, since I walked into my vocation here. And this is what I know about Steve Seeley. Um, and there's a lot I don't know, by the way. Um, but there's, this is what I do know, that Steve has this capacity to live out his sense of call on his life in whatever circumstance he finds himself in, um, with an ease and a joy and a genuine interest in and concern for others that is contagious. I know some, but not very much, about the disappointments of his life and the personal cost to him of his vocation because he does not burden others with that. And yet, he is always open and eager to find places to serve, perfectly content, it seems, in those places where nobody other than a few people might know what it is that he's up to. Steve was living the deacon's life long before he was ordained a deacon. Now, when the ordin ordination path opened up, he pursued it quickly as an optimal place of great potential. And he did everything in, a, in his power to make that path open for as many of his fellow deacons as he could. Which brings me to the archdeacon role, which is, among other things, care and concern for other deacons. And the same would be true for you, Steve, in the role as archdeacon as it was for you as a deacon, that you were living out this vocation, caring and concern for your fellow deacons, keeping an eye out for those deacons we had yet to catch up to and ordain, caring with the greatest of intention for the processes we were developing, so that when the time came around for us to name our second archdeacon in the diocese, we already knew who it would be. There was no question that the second archdeacon was already among us, serving alongside the first. And there is not a day that goes by when Steve doesn't tell one or all of us how grateful he is to be 
in this position. And do you know what a joy it is to be around a person like that? He's also, and this is a good lesson for all of us, um, we can all take a lesson from Steve in not being defensive when on the receiving, being on the receiving end of criticism, critique, or the hard-won lessons of any trial and error process. Um, Steve is receptive. Uh, Steve is dedicated to the traditions of the church and always open to new ideas. Um, and so as we commission you in this role, Steve, we give thanks to God for your persistence and your sense of call to this work. And one more thing, and this is a good word of warning for all of us who find ourselves landing in that place of great potential. And we can think about Jesus for a moment here when he uh, entered the temple, as we heard read in beautifully in two languages this evening, um, when he read the words from the prophet Isaiah, which were written thousands of years before. And as he read them, he knew. He knew that they were meant for him, right? And he said it, you know, he said it. This is like, yeah, this is it. I, like, I'm the one. And one way to read what happened next in the story of his life is that like everything unfolded just the way he thought it would, right? That's one way to read the story of Jesus. And another way to read it is that nothing rolled out the way he thought it would. But either way, the cost was really high, you know? It's really high. Um, that being in the great, the place of great potential is not a place of great ease or privilege or entitlement. It's a place of sacrificial ministry and love that'll break your heart. Um, but if you're called to it, as Steve is called to be archdeacon among us, you wear it on your shoulder with that kind of yoke that Jesus talked of. I mean, but the burden is actually pretty heavy. But when it's yours and Jesus has called you to it, it just lands on your shoulders differently. And he knows that. So friends, that's what we're here to do tonight. We are here to celebrate Steve Seeley's second potential, great potential call as a deacon, now archdeacon in the diocese. Um, and this occasion gives us the privilege and the, the opportunity to consider for ourselves those same questions. What would we do? What do we feel called to do, irrespective of any outer circumstance? What do we think is on our hearts that God has called us to, that we need to live out no matter where we are? And if you should need someone to talk to about that, or pray with you for about it, to ponder in your heart, let me tell you, there's no better person to ask than are now about to be officially installed Archdeacon Steve Seeley of the Diocese of Washington. Amen. Can you grab my notebook as well? On behalf of the Episcopal Diocese of Washington, we present Stephen Seeley to serve as Archdeacon for the Episcopal Diocese of Washington. We believe he has been prayerfully and properly selected, and we believe him well equipped for his duties.
Thank you. Stephen Eugene Seeley, deacon in the Church of God. You have been selected by the Bishop of Washington to serve as archdeacon and diocesan liturgist in the Episcopal Diocese of Washington. By this letter, you are fully empowered and authorized to exercise the ministry to which you have been called to serve all people, particularly the poor, the weak, the sick, and the lonely, accepting its privileges and responsibilities. Having committed yourself to this work, do not forget the trust of those who have chosen you and care alike for young and old, strong and weak, rich and poor. By your words and in your life, proclaim the gospel. Love and serve God's people, nourish them and strengthen them to glorify God in this life and in the life to come. And may the Lord who has given you the will to do these things give you the grace and power to perform them. And this letter is given under my hand and seal in the city and diocese of Washington on the 18th day of October in the year of our Lord, 2023, and in the 12th year of my consecration. Steve, do you in the presence of this congregation commit yourself to this new trust and responsibility? I do with God as my helper. And dear people of God, will you, all of you who witness this new beginning, do all in your power to support and uphold Steve in this ministry? We will. We will. Steve, accept this gift and be among us as a person who bears hope and light to all God's people. Amen. Amen. Steve, receive this tippet with the seal of the diocese as a symbol of your office. Amen. Amen. And as a bishop of the diocese, I now invite you to be formally seated in your stall, symbolic of the dignity and duties of your office. Steve, in the name of God and as Bishop of Washington, I install you as Archdeacon of the Episcopal Diocese of Washington. May the Lord preserve your going out and your coming in from this time forth forevermore. Amen. O oh God of unchangeable power and eternal light, Look favorably on your whole church, that wonderful and sacred mystery. By the effectual working of your providence, carry out in tranquility the plan of salvation. Let the whole world see and know that things which were cast down are being raised up, and things which had grown old are being made new, and that all things are being brought to their perfection by him through whom all things were made. Your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. I wonder if you might come out here, Steve, because people of the Diocese of Washington gathered, and with friends and guests, I present to you the now fully installed Archdeacon of the Diocese, Stephen Seeley.
We come to the close of a day that the Archbishop of the Diocese of Jerusalem in the Middle East has called a day of mourning for all those whose lives were lost or those who were deeply wounded by the attack, the bombing attack, the missile attack at the Al-Ali Hospital in Gaza yesterday, which was itself a day of prayer and fasting for peace. And as we consider the magnitude of suffering and the depth of conflict, may we seek from God the grace and wisdom to know how to respond. And tonight we pray. God of mercy and compassion, of grace and reconciliation, pour your power upon all your children in the Middle East, Jews, Muslims, Christians, Palestinians, and Israelis, and pour your grace upon us that we may not divide them in our prayers, but hold all together in our hearts so that all hatred may be turned to love and fear might resolve in trust, that despair give way to hope, oppression to freedom, occupation to liberation, and that violent encounters may one day be replaced by loving embrace, and peace and justice could be experienced by all. We ask this in your holy name. Amen. And let us pray together the general thanksgiving. Almighty God, Father of all mercies, we, your unworthy servants, give you humble thanks for all your goodness and loving kindness to, to us, to all whom you have made. We bless you for our creation, preservation, and all the blessings of this life but above all, for your immeasurable love in the redemption of the world by our Lord Jesus Christ, for the means of grace and for the hope of glory. And we pray, give us such an awareness of your mercies that with truly thankful hearts we show forth your praise, not only with our lips, but in our lives, by giving up ourselves to you and by walking before you, holiness, righteousness, all our days. Jesus Christ, our Lord, whom with you and the Holy Spirit, all honor and glory throughout all ages. Amen. Now go forth from this cathedral tonight in peace. And may the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit go with you and remain with you this night and always. Amen. Amen.